Welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff. Tonight, I'm your host, Joe, and we've got Aaron and Christian. We're trying out this video thing for the first time, and uh, it's a little different than we're used to, but you guys are going to see why. We've got a pretty special episode for you guys this time. Uh, but before we dive into that, Aaron, what are you drinking? So we actually went to uh, Indiana last weekend, and we stopped by and got some Three Floyds. So oh, I got, gumball I, head? I got their gumball head. I hate you. It's super good. <laughs> <laughs> Christian? Uh, personally, I am actually uh, drinking a little bit of something called water uh, for tonight. <laughs> hey, me too. A little late. <laughs> it's, it's been a long weekend. And, uh, yeah. you know, the headache is already setting in. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, yeah. <laughs> and it's a special episode. The discussion is going to be short tonight, um, because the, uh, episode this week is actually an interview from, uh, E3D's Sanjay Mortimer and me, and it ran a little long, um, the uh, entire interview is slightly over an hour of uh, some really great discussion between uh, me and Sanjay um, about completely different stuff than you guys would normally get from an E3D interview. So we talk a little bit about E3D products, but we talk a whole bunch about uh, 3D printing, uh, some theory behind it, some fun techie stuff, and some future vision stuff that we would both like to see happen in uh, the near and uh, long term. It was a really, really fun episode for both of us to do. Uh, a little bit of background, Sanjay and I have known each other for uh, a few years now, and we've had a lot of conversations like this where we just kind of like nerd out about what could be, and uh, they always run down some rabbit holes. And uh, I kind of let this interview do that uh, because it was fun, and um, you know, I, I think it turned out pretty well. Do you guys yeah. have comments? <laughs> Uh, I think uh, we want to get into it after we yeah, come back from the interview. That's true. Um, but yeah, no, it uh, definitely is a fun listen, and we hope that you guys definitely enjoy it. Hello, welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff. Today, we've got a special episode for you guys. We've got E3D's Sanjay Mortimer, and uh, this is a, a morning episode for me. So... The uh, the drinks that we're having are a little less adult and more like uh, water yeah, and apple diet juice. Coke. <laughs> what do you diet drink? For me. Yeah. Nice. I'm always on the diet coke, diet coke addict. <laughs> Stuff's gonna kill you, man. Rots you from the mm. inside out. Yeah, yeah. My um, my wife's a doctor, and she keeps telling me it's like a large cause of gastro cancer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, comforting. Well, you want to introduce yourself, Sanjay? Yeah, sorry, I <laughs> did too much time on code. Um, yeah, my name is Sanjay Mortimer. Um, I am one of the founders of E3D Online. Um, we make hot ends, most famously the V6, but I suppose in general, we're kind of like, we're an extrusion and R&D company in 3D printing. Um, whilst our like huge expertise is around pushing hot plastic out of tiny holes um, and doing so really well, we try and kind of look for hard problems in 3D printing and solve them and then package them up and sell them to 3D printing companies or consumers. So, you know, the tool changer, for example, isn't an extrusion system, but it was a really cool, interesting, hard problem. That's kind of what we do. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the tool changer some today, but, and, you know, to your, your intro, you don't always shove hot plastic out of tiny holes. You even have big holes that you shove hot plastic. Yeah, through. that's true. That's, that's, yeah. Um, we, we shove hot plastic out of a wide range of holes um, in various diameters, um, sometimes even shapes, um, various diameters and materials. Sometimes shapes. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I suppose, you know, every 
application has you know the optimal like resolution you know as you increase your diameter of your nozzle the uh, you know your maximum flow rate increases um, but your resolution goes down converse if you go to a smaller nozzle more resolution less time um, when you get to very large um, very large nozzles and very large sections and if you want to lay down in certain ways it can sometimes be advantageous to what what you're trying to do when you're forming a bead of plastic on your on your print is you're not actually trying to end up with a cylinder of material that's laid down you're actually trying to end up with, with a shape that's called a stadia um, which is a rectangle capped with um, two two semicircles Okay. Right, so it's a round-ended rectangle. Um, this, it's the shape of a stadium, a stadia, right? Look at an Olympic stadia, stadium. Yeah. And every um, time we talk, I learn something. I... Yeah, yeah, that's the name of the shape. So like, because you, you've got the nozzle at the top and you've got the print or the bed underneath, and so you've got these two planes, and then you're injecting the fluid into the middle, and the fluid wants to do its standard fluid thing, right? Um, where it comes out and forms a meniscus at either side. What you actually end up with is a stadia, um, and at the tiny scales that we deal with on our like day-to-day -day basis, squishing the material into the stadia shape is very low effort and unproblematic. Um, yeah. But when you get to some very large scales, um, you kind of and very high flow rates, the actual like the splurging it out into that stadia shape and that that aspect ratio. But I, I suppose particularly, it's less about absolute size but more about the aspect ratio so if you want a very wide thin layer um, that you want to put down so let's say you want to put down a i don't know, call it a one millimeter just for the sake of numbers call it a one millimeter layer but that layer has to be 10 15 millimeters wide right and you're kind of squeezing plastic out of a hole in the middle that then you know, the nozzle has to squeegee down there's a lot of pressure involved and also the nozzle has to you know stay in place quite rigidly so in that case you maybe you can consider like trying to extrude a ribbon mm -hmm. um, and then you have less work to do in terms of deformation of the fluid after like post facto exit of nozzle yeah well in you know, even when you're looking into things like paste extrusion, when you're trying to do big fat layers, um, also wide, I know um, some of the research in things like concrete 3D printing, uh, they've actually looked at square nozzles and hexagon nozzles yeah. because yeah, of, and of rollers as well. Yeah, which is kind of a neat thing, and people have done that in plastic as well. So you like have a a roller that follows the head on a slewing ring. So, you know, a thing that attaches and all the rotates such that the roller is always following the path just yeah. behind. Um, and so the material comes out and drops down as a cylinder and then the roller squeegees it into place. Um, yes. Yeah. And then they, uh, they have a uh, side dressing that comes back on the sides too. They, like, it looks like a scoop like this and the materials flowing. Uh, yeah, this way. <laughs> And uh, they, they just kind of like to dress the walls as the uh, it's flowing. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, super it's, cool it's things. Cool. <laughs> yeah, and there's, there's so much do. prior art in this, right? So the thing that like everyone must, must remember is that everyone's like, oh, isn't that fancy and isn't that complex, right? But like, I don't know, you've got a window behind you. Is that a PVC window by any chance? Do you, you don't have those yeah. in America. You don't really use double glazing. You just yeah burn yeah that, that, more, that's pvc more. yeah yeah and so that pvc extruded section is like absurdly complex if you look at it it is um and so they extrude those out of nozzles um obviously that have you know roughly that um that shape uh, accounting for some like die swell and deformation but then to hold everything um square and central they have like vacuum plates mm. that stuck onto the thing and um they, they use like a surface effect so there's um oh i forget what it's called but where you have like like the bernoulli effect where you have the high speed air and you know when you blow yeah, yeah. a piece of paper and it sucks up yeah they yeah. do that they do that to stop the extrusion like collapsing and shrinking in they're like 
and they like blow air like this and it like holds the extrusion in place in a non-contact fashion and then like oh. and people are always like oh I mean, you know it's so hard making filament exactly round it's like um, like we, we can do better so extrusion is something that humans have become quite good at um and frankly in the 3d printing industry we're kind of rank amateurs when it comes to complexity yes um in terms of miniaturization and precision and things like that um we you know we've got a lot more control because most extruders just run open loop steady state for the most part but yeah. like in terms of as it's being output we just squish it out of a circular drilled hole right um, yeah but there's there's, you know, there's a lot of prior art in that field and there's a lot that could potentially be done, I suppose. Well, that took a rabbit hole. Segways are hard, mm -hmm. but also very fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, uh, we, do we have a structure? What are we supposed to be talking about, Joe? The I, last I, you know, our, our episodes have a rough structure, but so far the interviews have been very freeform and like I have these scribbled notes uh that are are terrible but you know um the the other two guys on the podcast uh cautioned me this morning they're like don't let this get too technical and i was like nah it's gonna be technical because that's what's fun <laughs> um I, yeah to, to give you guys some background sanjay and i met at midwest rep rat fest a few years ago and um uh, we've been talking on and off on the internet for a these these random concepts for the last few years and our conversations are always very entertaining and take these wild turns like they just did so that probably won't be the last one um but i'm gonna try to keep to my 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 script here so to start how are you guys how's e3d how's sanjay like uh e3d is crazy um how's sanjay i just got married the 3d yeah. printed ring nice yeah yeah it's hardcore um <laughs> i machined mine like, but she was like you're not allowed anything 3d printed at the wedding no talking about 3d printers <laughs> you know, you've got too many of your colleagues and uh yeah snuck in the rings nice <laughs> that's um, awesome yeah um but yeah e3d in general is big and growing um it kind of blows my mind i you know I keep thinking that like surely everyone who wants a hot end must have one by now, but that never seems to turn out correct. Um, where, how have things changed? We moved into a big new building and we grew quite quickly and we ended up spread across um, kind of five units in this business park that we're on just outside oh, wow. of Oxford. Yeah, and it was kind of this higgledy-piggledy like we, we had one unit and then we managed to get the one next to it and then we needed more space so we got a shipping container and then r d was too noisy so we were like well we'll move that to another building and then manufacturing out and 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 so it goes and all of this occurred in the space of 18 months so there's like not enough time to bring like to get the correct type of building that you want yes. or to it would be completely absurd to have moved five times in those 18 months, yep. right? Um, and also the buildings weren't available. And so we we're just sitting there and then this place came up. Um, and so it's basically like three large warehouses, like warehouse rooms. Okay. Um, like, I, I don't know what you call them, but like the big shed shaped things, yeah, like yeah. warehouses, like three of those next to each other joined together. Um, and that's how we got it as an empty shell. Um, and we've done the kind of Elon Musk epoxy floor thing. And we've installed um, offices in the upper level. So we like put in a, we put in a floor if you like. Okay. Um, and so that was a big ordeal. And we just moved in here in January um, thinking, you know, this will last us forever, but it's full now. Yep. Um, that's how it goes, man. That's, that's exactly yeah. how the startup I work for is going. We just moved and we're already trying to buy the rest of the building and debating on building a building in the field next to us. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have to build another floor, but yeah, overall it's go uh, You're going to have to, sorry, people. Are... Sorry. The ta we've got tannoy systems. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll explain in a second. Hang on. That's why we don't record live. <laughs> 
So, uh, yeah, we've got IP phones throughout the building and all of them have a speaker on them. And then if you know the secret code, you can press in and make all the speakers in the whole building like on your hot mic. It's cool. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, so we've grown rapidly. We're up to like 40 people now, um, which is pretty insane. Um, That's we're, awesome. We're, we're making a lot in house. We do like loads of hot end assembly, like all the um, ALF objects, Lulzbot hot ends. Um, we're building tons and tons of those. Um, and for, for other companies like BCN 3D and many others. Um, so there's a lot of like building actually of hot ends and extrusion systems happening like literally below my feet right now, which is kind of neat. That's so um, exciting. And we're, and we're kind of bringing in house more and more. That's crazy. So yeah. with all that going on, what do you do outside of work for fun? Like what, what's, what's Sanjay after five or six or se whatever you guys work over there till you just, you just hang out, uh, go, go home and sleep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I know it sounds sounds like a corny answer, but like no. I know three D printing is my life, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, you know when when I can at the weekends, I come in and I kind of because I don't get as much time to do R and D while I'm at work. I kind of always have a queue of people that want something or some meeting. Um, so I I try and come in early or late or at weekends and kind of just bank holidays and just like fiddle with my own like little concepts and ideas and get some time in the workshop um that's a big one um so you're my favorite kind keep... of engineer you're, you're the well, what's that? you're the engineer that's like the nine to five engineer but then when you go home or when you're off work you're like you know i could be i could be working on this 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 project's been eating at me i need to do this it's... Oh man, like you have no idea. I, I, I think my problem is that like when I have like a problem or a project, it just becomes like all consuming. Like wake up at 6.30 a.m. And yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the one that I'm on at the moment. Yeah, which is like, how do we build the kind of... So V6 was designed and built for um, having contract manufactured machine parts come in and then having the user assemble them and having an experienced user and so on and so forth. Right. Um, so you have this like heater block and a heater cartridge and a sensor and they're all separate kind of modular elements in and of themselves, which eat, they're each, you know, a sub assembly, a heater cartridge in itself is a non-trivial piece of engineering. And so is the sensor cartridge. Right. Um, and, that all, all of those go into the block and the block is a, like an all sides machined milled part. And then, and, and so it goes. Um, so there's a quite a lot of, in, in terms of like broader market trends, we, the reality is that what we need to do to adapt and stay current is to reduce costs and improve usability. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's an interesting problem. Yeah. I'm a big, obviously like, uh, printing performance nerd. And so we're seeking to make improvements in performance as we go, um, but never at the expense of um, like uh, usability right. and, and cost, cost effectiveness. Um, yeah, um, yeah, next generation R10. So what we want to do is be able to provide something that serves the function of the nozzle, heat break, heater block, heater cartridge, sensor, fix it all of that in like a single self-contained, easily swappable unit that is extremely cost-effective. Mm -hmm. um, because at the moment, the reason why a lot of users don't change out their nozzles for whatever reason, even though they'd have great benefits from doing so is because it sucks. Like it's a sucky process. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, when people experience problems, troubleshooting then sucks as well because you know, you've got a nozzle clog. Well, you know, buy the, you know, you can buy this little five pound part, but then you have to do this process. And a lot of times people are like, well, you know, I'd rather just pay the 50 and exchange the whole hot end and not have to deal with that. And right. that's kind of a crummy situation for the user because they're throwing out loads of good stuff just because of one swap. And so 
And then if we can reduce, make these little these little parts um, that are cost effective enough, um, but really easy to use exchangeable parts that you can buy exactly the one that fits your needs um, and also swap it out as you as you need um, kind of more regularly like again the biggest impediment to people swapping out nozzles for the reason why you don't swap out your nozzle for every print to the correct one is because it sucks yeah like it takes like you know it'll take you 15 minutes by the time you found your spanner and heated everything up and like instead we want to like undo one like latch Yep. Clunk under undo a connector, slide it out, slide the new one in, clunk the latch down, plug the new one in, printer's good. We spent like, a bunch of time talking about this when I worked at Lulzbot when we were yeah. we were working together. So this this isn't a new problem. This is a hard problem. C- correct, yeah. And it's the kind of problem we like. Yes. Um because you solve the hard problems, then you're adding value. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you guys just dropped um a whole bunch of crazy high temp stuff mm. like the high temp heater cartridges that get yep. the temperature of the sun and uh the, the heater beds that you could cook pancakes on like easily <laughs> so um you know, what what's going on with all that what's what's the intent because uh, uh, yeah the backstory yeah um we were approached by um Airbus, the University of Exeter, and a company called Victrex. Victrex are the largest manufacturer of peak polymers in the world. And they were like, together, we should be able to develop a formulation of peak that can be printed really easily. Um, yeah. For certain values of easily, right? But well, yeah. nonetheless. Um, can be so printed. But... Can be printed, yes. It is not totally impossible to print usable objects. Um, and so we've been at that for like two and a half, three years. The material development, um, especially when it comes to polymers, is fundamentally slow because you have these like one, you know, reactors that yield one ton of material um, and you have to, you know, it, it, like these whole synthesis cycles and, you know, we're talking about like a hundred million dollars worth of equipment. Yeah. Um, and it's not like they get much time to like bring it down to do prototyping because it has to, you know, the ROI on these things is 10 years or something. So they've got to like, they have to make the machine do the work. Um, right. Otherwise they're losing revenue every day. Um, but they found a really cool way to prototype. They actually built an entire mini reactor, like a miniature. Yeah, anyway, um, it's cool. Um, but what it meant is that we could take peak and we could tweak it at the molecular level. Um, like this isn't what everyone else is doing with polymers where they like take some resins and mix them together and add additives where you had then end up with this kind of polymer soup of maybe like some different kinds of chains with some additives inside. We're talking about actually fundamentally changing the way the chains are assembled in the reactor, um, which is very powerful um, and you can do a great deal more and i expect to see a lot more of this happening um in the rest of the polymer world outside of peaks um i i think that's very exciting um so we worked with them to develop this material um and that's been really successful um we're bringing this peak to market again it's fundamentally slow to like b- make enough of this stuff but it's on the way it's happening so watch this space um but yeah, what we ended up with is a peak material that you can print without a heated chamber, um, has higher Z direction strength than Ultim printed on a Stratasys Fortis 900MC. Um, All right. It even outperforms their new um, PKK Antero 880 material. Um, and we're printing it in an open chamber, right? Um, on... Yeah, on on E three D hardware that like normal people can afford. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can take like any consumer. So the idea is that you should be able to take any kind of decent middle of the range three D printer um, 
or certainly if you are a printer manufacturer and you already have a printer and you want to uprate it, all you should really need to do is change out the heated bed to something that's quite a bit more powerful mm -hmm. and upgrade the hot end to something that's also quite a bit more powerful and slightly specialized. Um, and so what we need to do is be able to achieve a heated bed temperatures in the region of 150 to 200 and hot end temperatures of 400 plus and exclude drafts. So you don't need an enclosure, but you just need to stop like, you know, the air conditioner blowing on the machine. Right. Um, there are a bunch of performance enhancements and gains that you can get by doing more complex stuff, but I, let's not go into that because all our benchmarks are on uh, actually a converted big box machine um, nice. that just has a piece of acrylic slapped over the front and an open top. Um, we changed out the heated bed to one of these Mordor beds that we're now selling um, and changed out the hot end. The Mordor bed, um, or sorry, I think they were codenamed Mordor internally, I think on the website I there. Like the name. Some, yeah, something more professional like high temperature heated beds. But they're, they're, they're a sheet of um, aluminum tooling plate that we start the anodization process. And you know, in anodization, you open up the, like the pores on the oxide of the aluminum, and then you impregnate it with dye, and then you seal it. So we start the anodization process where we open up the pores, um, but then we don't dye and seal it. We take a semi-cured silicon heater mat, and we use heat and pressure to squish it into the pores of the surface oh. of the bed. And then we vulcanize it in situ. So this is really, really different. Um, it's the, something really important to get across. This is very different to other silicon heated beds because other silicon heated beds, they have a, an adhesive interface layer. Yes. And that adhesive interface layer is usually um, 3M467 MP, yep. which is um, you know that classic self-adhesive that kind of smells like, um, it's got like that fruity bubblegummy flavor. The, that, that smell to it, you, you know, the stuff like the same, um, same, same stuff as on blue tape, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, all that stuff all goes to hell above about 100. It kind of turns into chewing gum um, and the heater falls away. Whereas we're vulcanizing high temperature silicone rubber into the pores of the aluminium. And so that means that instead of being limited to 100, 120, we can go to 200 um, to 250. That's without any drama. That's very exciting. <laughs> um, and it's got a thermistor built in, and it's got some little, the mounting points have slots so that, with, you know, the standoffs that you put it in, they have slots that deals with the thermal expansion mm -hmm. of the aluminum. And then we're including um, very high temperature insulating standoffs. So you don't, so you can basically bolt it directly to something below, even a printed part without melting that printed part. Um, very cool if you use, if you use a brass standoff and you bolt it onto a printed part then it's, the things will not go well for you yeah no. <laughs> um, but uh, with these standoffs they're um uh they're polyphenol sulfone ppsu okay um these standoffs as long as you put some insulation underneath to stop the radiated heat then you could i, I suppose just bolt it directly onto printed parts um so that, that's the heated bed. Um, they run off mains because they need like mad watts. Yeah. Um, so there's, you know, appropriate cautions to be taken there um, and solid state relays to deal with. Uh, but, you know, these are, these are high end parts for like kind of quite industrial applications. And if you don't know what you're doing, then really you don't need to. Yeah. Like, it's it's for that crowd yep it's like the hyper enthusiastic maker that really knows what he's doing and wants to take on a big job and those safety implications or it's for industrial manufacturers of 3d printers mm -hmm. um, people that can look after themselves when it comes to mains right um so there's those and then we've got the the heater cartridges are kind of neat um they use totally different wire um, on the inside, that's not nichrome. It's got like a high melting temperature, low oxidation. Um, then they pack it in. So, uh, yeah. do you know how heater cartridges are made? Yeah. It's really crazy. And yeah, yeah. And so the the packing, um, the packing ceramic is, um, uh, it's not magnesium oxide. I believe it. I 
think it's an alumina, higher conductivity alumina. Um, the, so the, the whole object, the reason why heater cartridges fail is because of like hot spotting and expansion and burnout. Um, and so in order to improve their life at temperature, which is the problem we're trying to solve here, is that normal heater cartridges, they don't have a very good life um, at 400 plus. Right. In fact, sometimes it can be tens of hours. So it's kind of useless. So we build the heater cartridge such that it evenly distributes heat. There's less hot spotting and buildup, and it's better at transporting heat away from the coil that's inside into the hot end. Okay. Um, and so the insulation is a higher conductivity insulation that's packed to a higher packing ratio. Um, and then the casement itself is uh, coated in, I don't, I don't know what it is. Um, the manufacturer is being very stum on quite a lot of things about these heater cartridges. Um, we kind of developed them in hand, but yeah, the, they've changed basically everything. But they've got this coating on that's kind of like a, it feels kind of soft to the touch, almost like, um, you know, there's like soft touch polymers yeah, yeah. you get. Um, it feels kind of like that, but it's obviously not. It's like some carbon, it's black. It's like some kind of conformal carbon coating. Um, and it deforms when you um, clamp the heater block around it. Okay. It's, it's, like, it's like thermal paste, right? It does the same job as thermal paste. Yeah. So it's like a conformal coating that aids heat transfer from the case of the heater into the thing that you're trying to heat, in this case, a hot end. Um, and by doing so, by increasing that thermal transport and the even, evenness of the thermal transport, you end up with um, less hot spotting inside the heater mm -hmm. and therefore longer service life. Awesome. And excellent. So I'm just kind of going through my list. I'm bad at lists. Like that was a really good explanation of why you guys have dove into the high temp stuff. Because I think when it first came out, a lot of people were like, "Well, why? We've we've already got yeah. heat hot beds that can make 120, and whoever needs to go higher than 120, and it's people. People need to go higher than 120 occasionally <laughs> to do yeah. crazy, crazy things. I, yeah, it's a, it's not for everyone. It's for a, you know. If you need it, you already know about it. Right. To be clear, like if you have to be asking these questions, you probably don't need what we're selling. Yeah. If you're wondering, is this for me? Do I need it? The answer is probably no. Yeah. I probably shouldn't say that as, you know, the person standing to profit from you buying it, but uh, that's the reality of the situation. Well, you know, it, a lot of what you guys are diving into, it kind of falls into that. Um, and you know, one of those projects uh, I'm sitting here fiddling with is uh, Super Volcano. Like, Super oh, Volcano yeah. is so cool. It's what I've been dying for for years with my crazy tall, uh, eight foot tall printer and uh, some of the other weird projects I've built. But it's not an easy thing to use. No, you've got one that you're printing with it, right? Yeah. Yeah, sweet. And it's really fun. Um, the other night I was printing 0.6 millimeter layers uh, at 150 millimeters per second <laughs> with PLA <laughs> at 190 C. So sick. Um, but that's cray cray. <laughs> it was really really fun to print. Um, I uh, but you know when you when you are printing with melt zones that are you know. Here's a nozzle from the super volcano. So your melt zones yeah. are like two inches almost. Uh, you really start, and you and you're printing these big, huge, fat layers. Um, you really start fighting polymer issues like heat latency. Um, yep. And it becomes far more about how fast can I. It, it diverges far more from how fast can I melt this material to how fast can I cool this material? Ab absolutely, yeah. Um, because the surface, you know, your um, the volume goes up. Yes. As a square factor, but the surface area goes up as a linear factor. He says, uh, "Well, yeah, the, the cross section is squared, right. and the circumference, you know, as the circle increases in size, the area goes up as a square factor of the radius 
but the circumference only increases as a linear as pi radius, right? So as you go up, um, your you know the amount of heat in terms of the number of joules of energy that is inside of there um, goes up, right. but your wattage dissipation um, does not go up at the same rate. Um, and so that means that the plastic stays hotter for longer. Yes. Um, and this is a fundamental, like, pro you can't really get past this. This is geometry and physics. Yep. Like, it's, you know, it's nearly a mathematical truth. Yeah. Um, the way to get work, get past it is more air displacement around the part, just pumping constantly to cool that surface off. And uh, that's, that's what I've been fighting, is trying to get enough air to it. So right now, my solution is... Um, two 50 millimeter blower fans that are 12 volts running at 24 volts at full blast so, so you think you're cool bro you think you're cool i'll i'll take you a pit i'll take a picture of our setup downstairs you'll be so jelly so uh, we've got the shop air compressor hooked up um to solenoid flow control valves yes um <laughs> and we've got we've got like two pipes like coming in and I, I, you, you can dump like three i think it's like five bar goes in there and lots of air comes out yeah lots of air um, the, the only reason i'm not doing that is my air compressor currently um it blows a lot of water when I let it freely <laughs> flow like that. So yeah, we put filters on ours and everything to yeah stop the because it would kill the layer adhesion, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna get a desiccant dryer put in line and then start doing that. It, yeah. It's gonna be real fun. I'm so excited for Murph this year for the, all of the hilarious things. But one yeah. one of the things I'm really excited for, we talked about this a little bit ahead of time, is um, at at Earth. I kind of fell in love with the belt printers. I spent a bunch of time talking to mm. Brooke about a, his printer belt yeah. and talking to Bill Steele about his. And I have yet to build one, but one of one of my super volcanoes is going to go on a large format belt. And the Mazza V2 yeah. is my plan. My Mazza V2 will be a belt printer and hopefully by the end of Murph, I'll just have a whole table taken up with a rocket or something being printed sideways instead of super tall like last year. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know if we can talk about everything. I'm, I'm, I've got to watch my words here. Um, but Brooke proposed as well. Uh, tool changing belt printer. Yeah. <laughs> so that would be super cool, right? It would. Maybe we should talk about that yeah. offline. Yeah. Carrying on. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, I, th I think belt printers are very cool. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're obscenely cool. Uh, well, the thing that makes me excited about the them is like you've got this conveyor that I could be constantly cooling with the conveyor. Like I just have stationary nozzles around the print and oh okay yeah yeah so they have like a laminar flow yeah like have you seen on the stratasys machines where they have the big like it's like a snail blower but stretched prismatically um is that on they produce on their like infinite build area machine where they're building sideways no this is they, they have these you know you can't really see them but they're on all the dimensions of fortices but it's a you know it's a it's an air blower um, so it's like a blower fan, but you know, a blower fan is thin, you know, they're only like 20 mil thick, right? right. You get a 50 mil blower it's 20 mil thick. Imagine that, but one meter long. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so you have this big stretched impeller, kind of like what's inside of an air conditioner, right? Okay. You have the big long bar. Um, so you can buy those that are like one print area long, like 300, 200 millimeters. And then you can produce the laminar sheet of like moving air. Ooh. There is like a cross flow over the over the bed. Um, some Ultimaker printer people do this because they have a you know th that motion system has a consistent plane of where the action is happening. Right. And you can jet air right across. Interesting. I'm gonna have to look into this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
And what's neat is they have them in ovens as well, right? So you can, and hot air heaters. Mm -hmm. And so they make hot air heaters that are also these. So you can like do your heated chamber and all in one. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's good fun. Very cool. All right. So you brought up Tool Changer. So I'm, I'm going to bug you about it. Everyone bugs you guys about Tool Changer. So I was going to try to leave it out as much as I could. But where is it at? What are you excited for? I'm super excited because I'm in beta 30. So. Look at me. I'm in beta 30. I'm Sandy's favorite. Hey. Hey. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly how I feel. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. No, you are. <laughs> So yeah, where 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 are you guys at, and uh, what is Sanjay the most excited for with Tool Changer? So uh, Tool Changer is going well. I'd say that it's like bang on schedule um, thus far, which is really cool. If not, so some of the bits are ahead, um, and the things that were concerning me, like the little risk parts that were being tricksy, they're all resolved now. So and all yeah, everything's. So all of the, yeah, okay, so back up. We're, um, the tool changer is going to be sold as, A, there's a motion system. Then you can buy the tool changer parts and you can bolt the tool changer, i.e. the thing that picks up the heads, you can bolt that tool up picking head, which is a separate product, right. um, onto the motion system. And then you can buy your tools as you see fit and clip those onto the motion system as well. Right. Add electronics and you have a fully functioning printer um, that has a range of tools on it. So, but what first I heard product, you say is this is yeah. not out of the box a fully functional printer. Are you shut up? Yeah. No, no. I, I, <laughs> even yeah. even the people that I think get this don't get this. So <laughs> we'll beat on it for a second. It's not out yes. of the box a fully functional no, no, printer. I, it is a motion and, platform. Yeah, well, maybe we should back up to our objectives here. Okay. Um, and then people will understand why and how this is going down. Our objective is to proliferate the concept of tool changing throughout the 3D printing community, both commercial and hobbyist. In order to do that, we are providing a reference platform. Um, in terms of both a motion system that can carry it, a reference implementation of the tool changer and tool reference implementations. You can buy any part of that system individually um, and use it to build your own ideas. Your idea may be, I want a tool changing 3D printer and I want the lowest effort route possible to that. So you buy the motion platform, you put the compatible tool grabber onto it, and then you load it up with tools from E3D that are ready to rock. Alternatively, you may be a company that already makes 3D printers and you're like, well, damn, we could do with tool changing. What I'm going to do is buy the tool changing grabber, find a way to integrate it into my printer and then buy the tools and find a way to integrate that. And maybe it doesn't quite fit. We'll chat to E3D, figure out a solution and go from there. Um, and then as a hobbyist, you can do much the same. Um, so again, our objective is to proliferate tool changing among the whole 3D printing community. Um, so backing up, we have the motion system, which is the first puzzle piece, if you like. Right. Um, it's the most expensive, longest lead time part of the system. Um, it's not super complex because um, it's well designed as a simple system. Um, but it's got some of the most expensive long lead time parts on it, like linear rails and stuff. So that is all in-house. Literally everything to build the motion systems is here. They are putting together reference, um, well, not reference implementations, but they are taking the manufactured parts and they're test putting them together and testing them as we speak. So Greg is on that with Dylan right now. Um, all the tool changer parts are on the way and on order. So this is for, when I say the tool changer, what I'm talking about is the head that can pick up tools. Right. Um, so the head that can pick up tools, AKA the tool changer, um, is fully designed, tested, and on the way. Um, there are a couple of parts that cause delays on that. Um, one of them was the little gear that goes on the server. Um, it's really annoying because servo manufacturers, they um, they don't reveal the geometries of the splines on their, 
<laughs> yeah, it's really annoying. Anyway, we've figured out a way to get a good um, mod 0.5 proper metric non-proprietary gear onto this proprietary mess of a, a spline on the server. And so that's Excellent. all fine and dandy. Um, and uh, what was the other little thing that was causing issues? Oh yeah, Highwind um, being a pain with the rails. Um, they wanted like six months, six to eight months to produce the rails, um, which is just... Anyway, uh, after <laughs> yeah. some, after some uh, yeah, gunboat diplomacy in that like we will buy them from somewhere else, their lead time has now dropped to, to three months. So, um, but those have already they've been ordered some time ago. Anyway, they're, they're on the way. Um, they had enough stock to cover beta 30, so the first 30 machines, but obviously we have to produce several hundred of these things ongoing. Right. So, the motion system is in-house being built, very high confidence. It's, I mean, it's already working. I've seen it downstairs. It's going to be great. It's such a simple system from an um, engineering geometric complexity standpoint. It's fine. Um, the tool changer is going to come in. Um, that will need some serious testing because I don't have to worry about high wind rails lasting, um, you know, a thousand cycles, but I do have to worry about the tool changer lasting 10,000 cycles. Um, yeah because we built it and the wear surfaces and things like that. Um, so we've observed wear on the early brass prototype. So we're moving to higher wear materials um, like silicon bronzes and hardened steels um, for those wear contact points. So that's gonna require a bit of testing, um, but we're very confident that it's going to work and the high risk items, i.e. the wear contact points, which is the, the ramp ring mm -hmm. where the pin goes in and locks, that's a separate removable part. Yeah. Um, so if we need to change the design of that, you just we just have to design this little, you know, a new little ring that maybe changes the angles or increases the hardness or whatever. So it's a very low risk way of building it. Um, and we've had the this design of tool changer functioning for a very long time. Um, it works very very smoothly. Awesome. Um, so that's on the way. Tools. Uh, you know, the V6 tool is super simple, design, built, tested. Um, yeah, it's the kinematic coupling balls, machined aluminium plate with a, you know, L like standoff block. And we use the threaded heatsink yeah, instead yeah. of the groove mount. Um, and so that makes things super simple. Um, so that that's all good. That's kind of your sit rep on, on the motion system tool changer affair. So all going well. Um, risks ironed out, a little bit of testing to do on the tool changer for kind of longevity, mm -hmm. um, but very confident about the functionality. And yeah, we're, we're kind of off. So what we have now is a logistical problem, not an engineering problem for the most part. So it's kind of out of my hands in many ways, which is nice. <laughs> well, logistics, off to off. logistics can be sorted out. That's, that's, yeah. that's easy. Now that we, we have people. It's possible. It's, logistics yeah. are fine. Very cool. Very exciting. So yeah. what are you excited yeah. for with the platform? Like what, what's tickle yeah. your so with it? The, the like push towards release has hampered our ability to build tools because I've basically dictated to the team that we're not working on any tools until we have a like system out in the wild that people can purchase. Right. Um, to prevent distractions. Um, we have to race towards product, but the, array of tools that we want to produce is going to be super cool. Um, we had an intern in, uh, summer intern in, who, incredible guy, um, super smart. He's gone back to uni to finish up his degree, um, but part of his project will be a, a pick and place tool. So he's taking on what will be quite a complex um, tool in the system. Um, and it's a really exciting pick and place tool. I won't go into all of the details because it's his academic project. Okay. Um, but yeah, we, it's as I've discussed in, in talks before, it's not pick and place for like, you know, SMT chips and stuff. Right. Um, we want to place like useful mechanical objects into parts and be able to pick up a wide array of very oddly shaped parts. Um, and the design, it's like a tool changer in a tool changer. Okay. Yeah, it's like tool changeception. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I'll leave it at that. Okay. So it's, it's going to be super neat. Um, cameras with collimating lenses. 
Um, so you can do metrology. Um, that one's mainly a software problem. Yeah. The That's camera's be a, been designed an, for a while. An interesting problem to solve software-wise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but we've been doing a bit of machine vision here now um, for QC, actually, um, checking concentricity of PTFE tubes with... Um, oh, it's really freaking neat. Um, minor sidetrack, we have a machine that quality controls the PTFE tube by shining um, infrared light down the tube, which conducts like a fiber optic. Um, okay. And then that gets pressed up by the machine against a microscope slide that uses an IR camera um, this is all happening in a dark box through a collimating lens and it measures and it gets the concentricity and then automatically cuts the tube to length and then pushes that up. Yeah, it's, it's freaking baller. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it is like this little machine. It cuts the little lens of PTFE that you get with your hot air. Yeah, it's freaking sick. Um, that is far more anyway. scientific than my method of like stretching the PTFE out on the... the steel scale and then going looks right and with a single edge razor blade far more scientific yeah i love it i, I the the thing that we're checking for is the concentricity of the hole um because the process by which ptfe is made um ptfe tube is made is not like normal thermoplastic extrusion right it, anyway, it's like rabbit, a rabbit, rabbit. process isn't it yeah yeah it's kind of like um like yeah they extrude it and then they center it and uh, there's a lot of opportunities for the tube to deform throughout the process. Right. Anywho, anywho, uh, yeah, computer vision, we have some confidence that we'll be able to at least get that started into a usable open source project. Um, and then people who are more competent at software than us <laughs> can come along and integrate it and make an Octoprint plugin and so on and so forth. Right. Um, but effectively, what we intend to do is basically compare the G-code against the image that we get back. Okay, yeah. And then display you a diff. So hopefully, like, everything's green, but when there's, like, material where it should be... Where, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where, where there's material where it should be, it'll be green, and where it shouldn't be, it'll be red, and where there's material missing, it'll be black, something like that. You know, you get what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that'll be really fun, but that's a big software project, easy hardware project. Um then it gets into the weird stuff, and this is what I like really want to get into. I'm really raring to get into, but I'm kind of held back because we have to deliver to the customers that we've promised and taken money off of. Um, but once we've fulfilled our obligations and got product to market um, and have product in people's hands, then it's onto the weird tools. Um, so weird tools are like physical metrology um, and um, a hybrid. Yeah. stuff uh in in all of the ways so something one of the guys hacked together really recently that we didn't have much confidence that it would work but it was worth a go was actually using a yeah you know, have you seen drag knives mm -hmm. um so these are like absurdly sharp little razor blades that are designed for trimming like you know, these 100 micron sheets yeah. of material very precisely. And um, so we wanted to see if we could like print a 100 micron layer and then trim it back to precisely so, and then rinse and repeat. Yeah. Um, because if you can do that, you, you get rid of all this like motor spindle on the tool head, <laughs> chatter, cutting, yeah. heating, horror show. And you get these like perfect razor cut sheared edges with the nice surface finish um more experimentation required yeah it seems like has it some of would be a difficult because yeah. like drag knives live off of down pressure that's how they they like yes precisely and everything and so like if you have like a you know you would need a great deal of support material where you wouldn't normally have it yeah. for example um and yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of issues there and obvious geometric limitations with regards to overhangs and things. Um, but, it, you know, if you have a tool changer, then you can pick the tool for the job, right? Um, so, yeah, that's super. The, yeah, the drag knife is kind of just, it, it was easy, right? Because we bought a drag knife off Amazon and put it in the V6 holder and just kind of bolted it in there with a the printed part. And we're like, okay, let's like whiz this around the print, see what we can do. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of neat. Um, 
the the very the obvious one is the is the mill um which is you know obviously as people keep telling me on the internet that's never going to work as a milling machine it's not a milling machine it's a 3d printer that trims parts right yes. um so yeah the design of the spindle and everything for that like a very small bldc spindle mm-hmm. and or um in a lot of machining centers where you have like live tooling and tool post holders, especially ones with high pressure through coolant ability, you have these um, cutters that have a turbine inside. Um, so it's a spindle that doesn't have a motor, oh. but you hook it up to the through coolant. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so in this case, you hook it up to the air, to the air behind, and it, you know, it, it's it's a like a spindle, um, but it's super small, very powerful, and absurdly high rippums. Yeah. Um, so it's like dental drill grade rippums. Rippums. In a, That's wonderful. A rippum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, in the itty bitty package, it's effectively you know Bowden powered because the yeah. physical power source that you know the prime mover is off carriage. So that's pretty neat. Um, and, and those are fairly low air usage. So you don't need super high CFMs. Like you could run those off of a small compressor. No, small. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know what the consumption's like. I will take your word on that. Um, as uh, yeah, I'm not an expert on those systems, but I suppose the thing that concerns or the interesting part of that is that suddenly you're introducing a lot of air into your system, and I think this is going to be one of the fundamental issues that we're going to have to overcome with hybrid is that printing and cutting have some different physical requirements right. and so in cutting you want to like flood cool everything and chip evac everything like if you could you'd flood it with some plastic appropriate coolant um be that air or mist or what have you um However, if you use a fluid that is not air, then, well, that's just not going to fly right. because you're, you're going to leave residues on your layer interfaces and your part's going to lose all interlayer adhesion. And even if we're just using air to cool the part, let's imagine that we're printing a useful engineering plastic, so, you know, PC, for example. Um, we want the PC to stay very hot so it doesn't warp while we're printing it, but then we want to drastically and rapidly cool it while we're cutting it so it doesn't gum up on the cutter. Well, um, I think if we're just cleaning up layers, you're just cleaning up the, the little layer issues, you probably won't have to mess with coolant much or even air. Um, yeah. Because it's just, it's such a low cutter engagement. You know, you keep your RPMs yeah. in the right range. I think it'd be fine because most of the plastics yeah. that we're printing cut really well. I've machined a lot of printed parts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. So, um, yeah, I, I'm interested in your experiences there. Um, I mean, we're create, going to be making like tiny powdery chips. That's my main concern uh-huh. is just yeah. cleaning off the layer interfaces, and maybe that's just like a quick air blow. Um, yeah. From, like, so I'm kind of thinking that cooling fan or something. Um, I'm kind of thinking that we have like uh, air jets of controlled temperature, so we can apply force without. So yes. so we can decouple cooling and um, chip evac. Like, have you seen the hybrid uh, DLSM or DMLS machines that uh, companies like Sodic are making? Where you know, it's so do you mean the so there's one by the Japanese company that's actually like powder bed DMLS? Yes. Or do you mean the big like laser f- blast the powder at the yeah. into the laser beam on the machining center? I'm I'm talking about powder bed. So so not lens yeah. like Akuma's doing, but um, yeah, like, actually the powder bed. So they're you know they cut yeah they do like two layers and then they go back and then they yeah. machine them and it's all done. It, in the, it looks badass. It. It works surprisingly well. I spent a lot of time talking yeah. to one of the technical guys at IMTS this year. Oh, interesting. Um, so we can we can dive into the that. Because the mold right guys now. are like, 
the mold guys are super into that stuff. Yeah. Like the mold people are going crazy because you put the cooling channels and that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, absurdly high productivity molds. It's cool. And it, they're getting a cra- crazy tool life out of one millimeter end mills because they're taking such a little axial depth to cut. Um, yeah. And, uh, and and the wear is like it's like some cubic factor of your engagement and pressure, yeah. as I understand it. Um, so we're we're like running longer than any podcast I've ever recorded. This is great. Uh, no, we're only halfway through, dude. <laughs> Hell, you can cut it down. You can always make it shorter. <laughs> um. So, what's next? Like, we build the Whoa. tool changer. The tool changer works. The the tool carriage thing that you you've talked about in in past videos that thing works so we could get like a 20 tool head tool changer 3d printer that works what's after that what's what's e3d in five years what's what's the dream yeah um so in terms of major projects we got to finish up the tool changer there is titan v2 um which it's going to be a re- like from a commercial standpoint, it's going to be really, really nice. Um, it's going to be an extremely high performance hot end extruder combination um, at a very competitive price point. That's all I'll say for now because um, it's a very commercially driven project and it's quite a somewhat commercially sensitive. Um, it's actually not hugely like massively technically interesting. Okay. It's just a well executed tight design of known principles. Um, that we already have out there among the 3D printing world combined into one, done in a really tight package that's very, very highly optimized for design for manufacture, in essence. Um, So we can crank out a very high-end extruder at a very low cost. Okay. So Uh, you guys, as we've talked throughout this whole interview, um, you've mentioned commercial quite a bit. Are, are, is E3D changing its focus from the maker community to commercial community? Or is, is the support for the makers still there? So I, I think that the, what E3D does quite well is like catering to the whole spectrum, including like very weird applications. Um, so our intent is never to serve like this particular sector very well. Um, we seek to serve particular customers very well by like creating custom solutions. But I think that E3D's like fundamental market advantage is that we understand the underlying science of extrusion and how to design extrusion systems that work in a vi- wide variety of circumstances for a wide variety of specifications. I mean, you can, we, we basically have a bunch of Excel spreadsheets that are linked to CAD and like, you can tell us what your extrusion system needs to do, and we can crank you out an extrusion system that will do that. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of that's what makes us great is like more of the understanding fundamentally what we do and conducting more and more like fundamental research into how all of that occurs is very important to us. But in terms of a commercial maker shift, um, it's undeniable that. Um, a large portion of our revenue comes from selling to printer manufacturers. Um, But the majority of the printer manufacturers that we sell to are maker-oriented printer manufacturers. I think it's more that it's less that we are not catering to the maker community. It's more that the maker community wants to buy, like, you know, working, functional, good printers um, by default. And... If your printer already comes with an E3D hot end on it, then there's not much impetus to change it out for you know for something else. Um, so we're focused on making systems that are great by default, but will also enable a good degree of post-sale interaction because at the moment it's kind of difficult and you know a good competent maker has no great beef with changing out a nozzle but it's it's still kind of inconvenient right even for you or i changing out a nozzle is inconvenient um and so yeah we've got to focus on kind of usability and cost everyone wants things cheaper um but making things more and more usable um is kind of neat because we can 
allow people to do more with their printers more easily. Um, and so th that's kind of where our focus is going. Um, but those systems are still targeted at makers just through the vector of selling to maker oriented printer manufacturers. Yeah. I, I think that was a good move on you guys' part. Like you, you saw where the market was going and it's, it's very different than it was when you and I got into it five, six years ago. It, yeah, there's, yeah. There's far less people building machines out of random stuff that they bought at Home Depot and far more people going out and buying Ender 3s. So, yeah. And I mean, it's sad. there are plenty of things. Yeah. <laughs> but say what you will. I mean, there are plenty of things wrong with, you know, Creality or what have you. But the Ender 3 prints pretty damn well. It does. Uh, I, it hurts it, to say. It's got to be said. It hurts. That thing, it, like, in terms of a cost to performance ratio, damn, that thing is good. Uh -huh. You know? Um, it's scary good. And so that's, th these are realities. Um, and we, we have to deal with our, like, principles and where we came from and who we are and what we do, but we also have to cope with realities. Um, and the reality is that we don't want to cater to the race to the bottom, but there's a trend. Yeah. Um, and we have to ensure that our business still functions in those like macroeconomic trends that the market is undergoing. Um, and the big trend that we're seeing is more usable and lower cost. And we, we have to make systems that will, will fit in with, with that. Otherwise we will be crushed and we will die. Um, so. <laughs> and that's the sad reality, but it's, you know, it, Doing that is what is enabling you guys to do fun stuff like the tool changer. Yeah, but I mean, the... yeah, but also, also, this is like what we're going to do is really cool. Like, we're going to combine all these like multiple parts of a hot end into one single unit that we like automatically, robotically manufacture in house in like a vertically integrated system from raw materials. Like, it's some real like Elon Musk Tesla grade shit going down. Um, <laughs> Excellent. Like we're, we're talking like one roof, like ceramic coming in in boxes and bar stock coming in and bits of tube and ceramic insulation and heating wire and automated assembly occurring and amazing low cost, easy to use little uh, hot end things coming out the other side. I love it. And that means that we're generating the most value. Um, because we're doing the, the most in-house. Right. Um, so we're, we're generating the majority of the value, um, which is good for us commercially as a business. But from a technical perspective, it also um, affords us the greatest degree of control possible. Um, we can tweak everything in the system. Like we don't have to go and beg our heater manufacturer to like, can you please go and do that or use this other wire? And they'll be like, mm, uh, yeah, I don't really want to because I've got a big order coming. Like, no, like we want to play with a new thing. We can play with a new thing. Yeah. Um, so the degree of technical control is really cool. And I think it's going to allow us to do things that are really quite impressive in the like consumer hot end world. Um, like hot ends that heat up like that um, and have absurdly good temperature control and allow us to get huge amounts of thermal flux into into the polymer in short spaces of time and space. Um, it's yeah, it's not boring. It's not just paying the bills, boring stuff. There's some there's some good hard science to dig our teeth into there, um, and I'm finding it very fun. Oh, good. That's that's what matters. Well, yeah. Do you have other things you want to talk about? We uh oh, you know what? Like I can dance all day. I can dance all day. <laughs> <laughs> like um what's it going to take to get to the next level for printing? Like we've got really good mechanical platforms. Everyone can build a damn solid gantry that can print excellent benches all day long. But, yeah, I mean, the, there's no fundamental advances to be made in motion systems. As far as I see it, like, you know, motion systems, we've been doing motion systems, like good machine motion systems since the 1700s when 
like we started making good metal lathes, right? Um, and then subsequently milling machines, and then since the '60s, we got CNC and servos, and everything there is like we just need to read the textbook properly, um, and you can make a good motion system. Yeah. Unfortunately, people haven't been reading the textbook properly for the last three years, and there have been some horrors, <laughs> but that's kind of being worked out of the system now, and things are going okay. As far as I see it, there are three fundamental things that permit like the, 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 the core advances that make 3D printing what it is. One is materials. We have to have materials that, that print exceptionally well and have exceptional end use properties. The second is software um, and software is probably the you know one of the largest single enablers. Um, you know, it's worth bearing in mind that a piece of software controls absolutely every aspect of how your part comes out, how strong it is. Yes. Um, you know, in, in a way, the design that you put in doesn't really matter. Um, it, how the software interprets your design is what really counts. And so I think there's going to be some huge advances there, but that's going to require um, a revolution rather than incremental approaches. I think that our, with, yeah, slicing is, you know, like, Cura, for example, or we, we, remember the Skin Forge days? Oh, yeah. Right? And Rep Snapper and stuff. Like, we started out like, well, we've built this like facsimile of a 3D printer. We need something to drive it. So let's create something that can slice a cube. And we went from slicing a cube and then we like put in bridging and support material and infill patterns and stuff. And, you know, Cura was based on Skeenforge, yeah. as I understand it, yeah, um, which was like the original, and they converted it to run on PyPy, and then into C and then it became Cura. But we still have, you know, we take the three D model, we slice it into layers, and then we do two D operations on those layers, mm -hmm. and off we go. There's there's a lot more to be done there. I feel. Um, yeah, like whatever happened to non planar slicing? Like that yeah that's such a cool idea and so fundamental to how our layers are formed and how our strengths are done it, I, yeah it, and I'm, also and i think it's hard because dfm for that is hard yeah um as with many things and um, i think that 3d printing abstracts away from cam very well mm -hmm. in that you never have to like it trivializes the cam process which is kind of its biggest advantage because it's yeah backwards so, um but at the same time it makes people think that cam is just clicking print and it's like oh no you actually yeah. have to tell the machine what to do yeah, yeah. <laughs> people going from 3d printing like from additives and subtractive have this rude surprise when they can't just put the model into the slicer and then the automatic tool changer and the five axes just get to work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rude awakening. <laughs> uh, but I think that we could do with a little bit more of like cam in 3d printing. Like I want, you know, let's get rid of STLs and steps and like, I want this boss to be printed in this way. And I want to, uh, all this kind of control. Yeah. Um, there, there was a, uh, for a while there were um, all these, efforts going on to do like 3d printing specific file formats like amf and there's a there were a couple so, dude, others step, that, like step <laughs> just just stop yeah just give a step just give me a file format that i can click on a feature and say i need this hole to have eight perimeters and everything else doesn't matter this hole needs eight perimeters yeah. that's all i want yeah yeah <laughs> I, I I know, dude. Or like between these holes, I need to like reinforce. It's like one of the cool things that I think Mark Forge does is like between these holes, I need this amount of load capacity in tension, and then I'll string enough fiber around those holes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like. Oh man, that was one of the things I wanted to talk about. Like continuous fiber. Yeah. Get rid of all the chops. It seems like every chop and filled filament I've used, it just it's just weaker than its original base material because the chop screws yep. with the polymer bonds. Uh, 
I think that there's some material science that needs to be done there yeah. um, to sort that out. Like if we look at um, injection molded fiber filled parts, they have higher tensile strengths than their unfilled brethren, yes. as well as higher moduluses and things like that. The but with those are we, I, watch this space. We've got some cool stuff coming out, but uh, essentially the 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 interactions between the fibers and layer adhesion and some other things result in poor properties there are ways of solving that by changing the way the material flows yeah, um, yeah i'm trying not to dive too deep into material science because you guys um they thomas how do you say thomas's last name san ladder yeah what, what sanjay just said uh, and um and uh, rich they did a really awesome podcast a week ago two weeks ago on the mill yeah. zone and uh, there was an audio mishap, but seriously, sit down and listen to it. Because uh, if you're a materials nerd, that was a great session. But like, what do you think it'll take to do continuous fiber uh, on, so, on a desktop? I mean, was, not 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 buying a Mark Forge, but like you and me. Yeah, um, I'm not sure because as far as I see, as far as I'm aware. If you're pushing continuous fiber, thermoplastic, continuous fiber out of a heated nozzle, I think that you're covered by the Mark Forge patent. Oh. I, I, am, okay. I am not a patent lawyer, um, and I, so I don't know that in depth, but I believe that to be the case. And so that's why we haven't worked on any fiber systems. Okay. Um, so I, I and, saw a university project on it two years ago? Um, but you know, th those patents may have come out since then that they were, uh, fluidizing carbon fiber, um, and running it down with a UV reactive resin. And that was really neat because that's cool. So they're like, what they, they vibrate it. So it kind but of, it was, um, no, it was, it was seriously, they were, uh, it was like a paste extruder, but they had a continuous strand of carbon fiber inside the paste extruder. And yeah. they got it started and then coiled the carbon fiber into the syringe and then filled the syringe with, uh, <gasps> with this resin. Ah, and that's cool. Yeah. And they were just, you know, plunging it. And as the resin came out, it would feed out the carbon fiber and then they were able to build it up. It cool. And it, yeah, I, I saw it cause, um, uh, it was when I was working for Lulzbot and they were using a TAS six as their motion platform, which I thought that's was super cute. neat. Um, but yeah, it, it, that was a really simple uh, design uh, for a labby type experiment, but it seemed like a relatively easy concept to bring into a product uh, for engineering purposes. But um, yeah, yeah, I, it takes a while I, to go I, from the I lab. Know, so I, I like. I know of people that I, the things that I can't disclose, but I, I know of other people attempting continuous fiber systems. Um, but it's something we're kind of staying out of. Um, yeah, I would love to, because there's obviously these uh, amazing performance gains. Um, but yeah, I, we'll see how that kind of plays out. Um, but it's not something that we're, we're getting involved with. Um, Maybe we should go reread the reread the patents some more. We'll but uh, as far as I see it, if you have a nozzle, you have thermoplastic, and you have continuous fiber, and uh, it's coming out of the nozzle, I think that you're covered. Okay. Well, that's a good reason to not do it. I mean, uh, people are taking patent law pretty seriously right now. So. Yeah. Uh... Yeah. Um, well, hey, that's the end of my list. Um, we're definitely past the hour mark now um i don't want to yeah. hold you for any more time do you have anything else that you want to talk about that you want to well you have um, a platform oh. i think rory is designing a, a, a an a and b axis for the tool changer what <laughs> yeah yeah, yes. yeah that's, that's a cool uh, that's very early stage so we have this thing called like wonderful wednesdays where um the engineers get to kind of work on their own thing um, and that's Rory's wonderful Wednesday project at the moment. Um, well, tell Rory if he needs help. There's a guy yeah. that's you know a few hours off from him <laughs> that is in. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't seen it. I don't know if it's like Trunyan or what have you. Um, that would be the easiest way. I I was trying to get uh, when I when I worked for Cat, I was trying to get them to fund me for uh, five axis printing, and not not um, necessarily coordinated motion, but just simply reorientation of the build platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a three plus two is fine. Yeah, uh, that would be amazing for getting uh, your strength vectors in the right direction, and but it brings up yeah. a huge software challenge. Um, and it would be a, Enorm a really fun Enormous. one to work with. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think that if we have this like merging of CAD and CAM for FDM, then we can start to do some cool things because we can, you know, break up parts into sets of features and decide that this will be done in this orientation mm -hmm. and so on. So I, I, I have faith. Um, you know, I, I would like to see ultimately something that's kind of like um, HSM that's been integrated into Fusion, but instead of removing material, you're adding it. Um, that doesn't seem like an enormous step. Um, and I'm always shocked that HSM don't have a slicer, right? Um, well, they have NetFab that's kind of like being integrated. It, I wouldn't be shocked if it was like in the pipeline. Based yeah. on some conversations yeah. I had with them at uh, IMTS, I, I would not be shocked if that wasn't coming down the road. Yeah, but I, I'm I, I would not be shocked if Autodesk just came out with a slicer, right? But I I just uh, if I was them, I would have done it already or acquired one. Uh, the guy who made Mesh Mixer, because he's he sold to Autodesk, mm -hmm. um, but he's now no longer with Mesh Mixer. He's doing a really cool looking new slicer. You seen that thing? Uh -uh. Um, Do you know what it's called? It's got a weird name. Of course it um, does. It's 3D printing. Why should it have a, a straightforward name, like, thing that makes parts? <laughs> Slicing Software 3. Um, yeah, the, uh, the current iteration of NetFab that Autodesk has out, it brought in the Spark Studio stuff that they were doing for a little while. So you can slice uh, with normal FDM printers. It's just not super uh, straightforward to set up printer profiles for the ones that they don't support, uh, which like they support like Ultimaker and Type A and a couple others, but uh, nothing. Uh, Sorry, who, who's this? Which package is this? Uh, the Autodesk uh, with the their newer NetFab. Uh, oh, I see. Doing. Yeah, so, you know that NetFab had a slicer for Ultimaker twos before Cura, I think, existed. Um, it's probably so, built on this. This is probably built on that slice engine. Yeah. Um, so Ultimaker used to sell NetFab the slicer. Um, huh. Yeah, back in the day, <laughs> that was a thing. That was a Wednesday, for those that don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm trying to find the name of the slicer for you. Um, if you find it, but, shoot it to me over email or yeah. uh, whatever. Uh, I think we should probably wrap up. Uh, I, I think that's probably sensible at this point. I've, at this point, I am very late for work. <laughs> oh, dear. yeah, sorry. It's fine. It's fine. I, uh, I'll make it up. But um, with that, uh, this was Joe for Makers on Tap with Sanjay Mortimer from E3D Online. And um, if you have any questions for me or Sanjay that came up out of this interview, uh, hit us up on our social medias. Uh, the subreddit is r slash Makers on Tap. We're on Instagram, also as Makers on Tap, and same for Facebook. Um, and uh, if you thought this podcast was awesome and you want to let your friends know about it share us all over the internet we're you know we, we like it when people let us know that they like us by doing things like commenting and oh yeah sharing. we'll have to put you up on twitter man yeah we, we'll have to make sure we post we, we we need to get a twitter maybe i'll do that today all right yeah do it. so with that i'm out thank you guys and uh you know keep making stuff yeah thank you very much joe and we're back. So 
you guys made it through the interview, hopefully. Uh, if you didn't, maybe you skipped to this timestamp. Um, I had an absolute blast talking to Sanjay, and we've actually since then talked about making this a recurring thing every couple of months where we just like ramble on some some rabbit holes and, and see where they go and, uh, you know, have some fun with it. But what did you guys no, think? No, absolutely. The, like, just just the conversation I immediately, like, posted in our kind of, like, group discussion. Like, um, I was really sad that I missed out on this opportunity to talk with Sanjay because, like, he just seems like such a cool guy to talk to, especially when he's drinking um, because of just the – the train of thought that that man has of like connecting things is incredible. Um, and just listening to some of the theory stuff and him getting so excited about that was just like really kind of, wow, this guy is really passionate about this and you can actually tell it's not just this PR kind of thing of like, yeah. Oh no, I need to be excited about my job. You can genuinely tell like he is excited to like go home and also continue to engineer and continue to make stuff in his own personal life. Um, and he just continues to like carry that on throughout his day. So um, yeah. it was really fun. It was a really fun interview to just listen through and kind of listen to all of the different rabbit holes, but also cool things that are coming in the future. Well, and the Sanjay is kind of like us where he's a maker in his professional life. And that just never ends for him. Like it, it, it's just a, a continual stream and the main difference between him and this interview and him it, with a couple beers in him is the stream of consciousness is harder to butt into. And um, <laughs> it, it gets a little more interesting uh, just because he gets a little more like, but what if we try this? <laughs> well, and that's, and that's the funny part it. was you could so much you fun. could even tell like during the interview, he was already having like trains of thoughts of like, Oh, that would be interesting. Um, yeah. Or that would be kind of cool to try out. And it was just like, that was kind of cool to just see those gears kind of churning on a professional level and all that kind of stuff. It was, it was definitely a fun interview to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. I was also sad. I kind of missed it. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next ones. Yeah. About 30 minutes before the interview <laughs> started, Aaron sent me a text and was like, Hey, I'm not going to make it. Try yeah. not to let this get too technical. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> no yeah <laughs> I'll let it go where it goes it wasn't too so, bad um no you both were, were actually pretty good with at least he was explaining um the overall details of what of like the high level of what he was about to go into like for instance the uh the stadia the yeah. stadia of the the filament coming out and i personally did not know that so it was nice that yeah, he I, did the, the, the technical side but also broke it down so then you can at least follow still so that was nice. Yes. That's what's so much fun about to talk to any of those guys. If you go talk to them at trade shows and stuff, that that's how all of them are in person is just super fun and super willing to break things down. If you don't quite understand, um, very down to earth and, and really great guys. So. No, well, absolutely. It was really cool. Also, um, especially getting follow up from, uh, one of the earlier news episodes we had done a little bit ago on uh, the new tool changer. Um, yeah. We got a lot more de detail into that and even some possible things coming out for that that we didn't even have details on back then. So it was kind of cool, especially like me being the very much noob on that, not knowing a whole bunch, hearing it directly from Sanjay and being like, hey, this is actually what we're looking at. This is what we're trying to shoot for. And just getting clarification on that. Um, this is very much a tool for you to be able to put on things, not necessarily a kit out of the box. And yeah, just right. them reinforcing that of like, this is what we're shooting for and all the things that we have possibilities for. But really, you have to implement that on your own machine. Yep. Um, so it's cool. Like we, we kind of like did this new story a little bit ago and we were kind of like, this is cool. We really want to like see more stuff. And now a little bit more episodes down the line, we're actually seeing like, Hey, this is what we actually are doing. So it's, it's kind of cool continuation from one episode to another. And I don't know, I kind of like that. We're building this little kind of cool thing between the episodes now. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm really looking forward to the end of November when one of those shows up in illinois 
at my house. Is that like is that part of the? Because I know you said I I don't even know what the beta thirty is. He apparently made fun of you for that. Oh no! <laughs> but yeah. um, Joe, Joe, Joe gets special access to buy into this beta program, and he get, gets one of these motion platforms like the sucker he is. Yeah, I'm I'm a total sucker. I'm a total fanboy. It's fine. No, uh, beta thirty is uh, you know, like you said, they're building thirty beta units uh, as a release candidate, just to make sure that when they release them to the real world, that they work. Um, and that you know, the couple that they've built in house so far uh, work like they expect when they ship them out to a whole bunch of people. So. Um, I'll be one of the first 30 to get one. And then after that, they're going to do a release of 100. And then they'll go into full production if beta 100 works out. So Wow. Okay. No, that sounds awesome. Um, I really hope that maybe after full release, we can definitely get him back on to just hear about the process of how they went through the whole thing. And um, just like all the cool stuff that went into it. Because it definitely... As much of it sounds like a tool that they are using for commercial use in some aspects, they are definitely still trying to make it for makers as well. Yeah. Uh, and he kind of made that clear. He's like, it may not be for you, but there is people out there who this is exactly what they need, and we are trying to make it as best for them as possible. Um, and we might have him back on for that, but I... I feel like our podcast covers like a whole different world with these guys, like uh, the the Tom's 3D and the 3D printing nerds and, and all those guys. They do such a good job of covering the commercial things and yeah. like um, and all of that. But he, we've been able to keep all of these so free form and um, and really fun and uh, very conversational. I'm hoping mm -hmm. we can keep that instead of just becoming industry news like everyone right. else. Right. So I really I enjoyed to... all the personal questions you asked them. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I want to get into. Like, why why are you the way you are? Talking to all these all these uh, industry maker professionals, like anybody else could talk about products and, and design and stuff, but what makes you tick? And, you know, what gets you excited yeah. when you get home from work? You know, that's yeah. stuff that I like to, to learn. Because you got to remember, like uh, the three guys that started E3D, Sanjay, Josh, and um, 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 mm, it'll come to me. Uh, Sanjay and Josh are the two that I talk to very regularly. It, it, they came out of university and then they started building hoddens in their basement. Like the original E3D hoddens were were just a project that they made in their college machine shop and like. Uh, released on the rep rat forms they're they're us they're just incredibly brilliant successful us so you know, Ouch. Yeah, right? i know <laughs> my um, feels you feel identified um <laughs> yeah a lot of a lot of the interviews that i'm trying to line up are people that have been passionate about a project and made it and mm. uh been able to uh create something great and then you know share that with the world and kind of be inspirational you know but no absolutely okay this is officially the longest episode that we've ever released <laughs> and uh, it has the least amount of us in it so um if we want to recap more uh we can definitely do that next week there's a ton of news that we wanted to get to um but i kind of feel like we should leave it at this yeah. point and get it next week um so with that uh this is joe and aaron and christian keep making stuff guys